There I am. Hey, there we go. How awesome. you doing, Lisa? I'm doing great. How are you, Mike? Uh, great. Nice to meet you. Thank you for, finally virtually. <laughs> thank you for uh, helping to put on this awesome conference. It's really oh, not been a problem. great. Not a problem. My pleasure. Um, and I'm glad you volunteered to give this speech, um, this talk on, uh, and as I understand it, your talk is going to be about uh, how to get uh, testing bottlenecks uh, out of your deployment pipeline, mm -hmm. right? Right. Okay. This is going to be interesting. So I'll leave you with the floor, Lisa, and I'll just drop off and let you okay, take over. Share my screen. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Can people see my screen? It looks like looks like people can see my screen. All right. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about getting those pesky testing bottlenecks out of your deployment pipelines. And this talk is based on work I've done <clears throat> with uh, people who know a lot more than I do. Uh, Abby Bangzer, Ashley Hunsberger, Lisa Hawk, Janet Gregory, and, and a lot of other people. So it's a, it's a collaborative effort, and I'm happy to share these ideas and techniques with you. And so a little bit about me. I've worked as a, a hands-on tester for the past couple of decades on generally on cross-functional agile teams and learned a lot and and shared experiences together with janet gregory uh, in the books that we've written together uh, a video course a, uh, a a live agile testing for the whole team course which is now a remote course and i recently joined out systems i wear my out systems jacket um yeah as a quality owner kind of a funny title but basically kind of helping all the engineering teams uh, build more quality into the product. And my focus is on observability, which I don't know a huge amount about yet, and I'm learning. I'm always happy to talk on Twitter or uh, by email. So feel free to contact me anytime. And in my free time, I, I uh, play with my three donkeys here in Vermont. They pull carts and do work around the farm. So we have a lot of fun together. So I'm going to talk about, you know, how do we succeed with continuous delivery or continuous deployment if you're if you're doing that or you're trying to work towards that and have confidence that you didn't break anything as you're doing these frequent small changes to production. How do you make sure you don't have regression failures? How do you make sure that your latest change doesn't impact something unexpected? But how do you do that and not get bogged down in testing? And the secret behind it is it's a whole team effort. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've been lucky to be on teams that succeeded with continuous delivery even before we had that word. And, and I think one thing that made it possible was committing to having a high quality product, the best quality that we could have, and doing what we could to do to overcome the obstacles to make that happen. So that's basically what I'm just sharing. So um, Jez Humble and Dave Farley's book, Continuous Delivery, when I read this back in 2010, I might have actually read a manuscript version of it in 20, 2009, my team was already doing this and I was so excited to find it had a name. But chapter five of the book, talks about manual test stages. And, and this really resonated with me as a, somebody whose primary specialty is testing. That the manual test stages of our deployment pipeline assert that the system is usable and fulfills its requirements, detects any defects not caught by automated tests, and verifies that it provides value to its users. And so some of the stages, as examples they gave, were exploratory testing, integration, user acceptance testing. I would add things like accessibility testing, some types of security testing, maybe manual. Uh, I like to use the word human-centric rather than manual, because manual, I don't know, it just has kind of a status problem with it. But whatever you want to call it, uh, there are things that we have to do to feel confident about our product and about our product quality. And they are part of our deployment pipeline. And in the book, they said that manual test stages are common to all projects. They assert the system is usable, meets the customer needs, um, 
when def detect defects are automated test miss, verify that we're given the value that we intend to give to our customers and, and with those examples. So they are part of the pipeline, but they are often forgotten. So uh, one of the teams I was on more, more recently, we wanted to move towards continuous delivery. The holy grail, everybody's doing it. All the cool kids are doing continuous delivery. And we had moved our, our web-based application from a traditional serving environment to the cloud. We had a deployment pipeline, we had blue, green deploy, we had, we had um, all the things. And so the development director proposed that we start deploying to production twice a week instead of just once a week. And, you know, he pointed out the smaller changes meant less risk. That's very true. So lower risk of problems and regression failures. But we were still struggling to fit in those manual testing activities. So we still had like a manual regression checklist that we did every release and or every deploy. And that doesn't really work when you're trying to deploy two times a week or even more times a week. It's like, ooh, how does how do you do that? And we had a lot of challenges to overcome. And so I was really feeling anxious about this. And indeed, we had a lot of struggles at first. Sometimes we couldn't release at all during the week, much less twice a week, because we were having a lot of problems. And so I looked for things we could do to improve that situation. We knew we had the manual testing activities. We knew we wouldn't feel confident releasing without doing them, but we weren't sure how to, we weren't really thinking of, of them as part of our pipeline. So one thing I learned from my co-author, Janet Gregory, is when you have a problem, make it visible and talk together about it as a team. So this is an example of a deployment pipeline doing continuous delivery. And the stages in yellow are the manual ones, the human-centric human ones. And so doing those in line, if you're trying to do, if you're trying to deliver multiple times a week or especially multiple times a day, you, you obviously can't get those manual things done. Um, but I didn't really think about them as being a part of the pipeline until I sat down and actually visualized what our pipeline looks like. So having these kind of visuals is really, really helpful. So if somebody commits a change, it's got to go through all these stages. Some of them are automated, some of them aren't. We need to be aware of what all those stages are. And we know we can use things like release feature toggles and other techniques to take these manual testing activities and make them asynchronous and keep the new changes hidden in production, turned off, not let the user see it, maybe expose them only to ourselves internally uh, until we finish these other activities that take more time and feel confident to turn them on for everybody. There are a lot of different techniques that you can use to do this, canary launches, dark launches. Um, and so this made us conscious of, yeah, that's, we, we can use, we're going to use feature flags and we're going to take these off offline and make a plan to make sure all these testing activities get done and know when we're ready to turn new changes in production on and just release when we feel confident about our code. And so what does that mean? So this is a thing I learned from, from Abby Banger initially. Um, and Abby made a card deck with all the potential stages she could think of for a pipeline, static code analysis, automated unit tests, automated API tests, uh, deploying the test environments, things that may be automated or manual. And, and honestly, even if you didn't have anything automated, you would still have a pipeline. You still have steps or stages that any change in your code has to go through to make it out to production and get in front of customers. And visualizing them using these kind of cards, or now we would use online cards, uh, using some online collaboration tool like Google Jamboard or Google Draw or Miro or, or uh, 
mural, we've got lots of, of great online tools we can use for this. Visualize these different stages. How do they look now? How could we speed them up? And in particular, for our testing activities, how can we speed them up? And because I talked about these manual test stages, I think uh, making the team aware of the manual test stages is the first step to solving the problem of how are we going to keep those from being bottlenecks? What can we try? What can we experiment with to remove those bottlenecks? The answer may be, hey, we're not we're doing this manually now, but it's actually something we could automate. So let's automate it. And then a lot of things aren't going to be automatable. You can't automate all your exploratory testing. You probably can't automate all your accessibility testing there. Um, and, and you can't do everything at once either. So when you're first starting out with your deployment pipeline, there may still be a lot of manual things. So just look for where those bottlenecks are and think of experiments to try to get rid of them. Now this, this activity of visualizing your pipeline, it's a quick thing. You can do this with your team in under an hour and get started with identifying bottlenecks and start working on those. So it doesn't have to take a lot of time. It's it's one of those small frugal experiments that you can try that, um, you know, even if you find for some reason this doesn't help you, you didn't waste a lot of time. So I would urge you to give that a try. And so look for the ways that you can identify, first of all, identify what are your manual test stages and then see how you can do different approaches, such as using release feature toggles to keep them turned off in production until you feel confident to turn them on. Now, uh, manual tests are an obvious bottleneck because we know it's like, well, we're releasing every day, we're deploying every day. Um, we can't do all of the automated exploratory testing, even if our changes are small, it's probably going to take too long. But there are other bottlenecks. And those of you who've worked with automated tests for a while have probably experienced flaky tests, the dreaded flaky tests. So tests that fail and we're not sure why they failed. Maybe it was a timing issue. Maybe it really was. I've, I've been on teams where we flagged tests as flaky, which I think is a, a terrible thing to do. But nevertheless, we had done that. And then when we took time to actually look into the flaky tests, uh, some of them were finding real production problems and it was just a timing issue that was hard to reproduce. Uh, so be careful about that. Sometimes the feedback from the test is too slow. So we really need to find ways to speed up the feedback from those tests or maybe refactor those tests or maybe even delete some tests, uh, tests that we don't understand that aren't providing value, maybe better off without those tests. Uh, sometimes tests, maybe we've been running an automated test for five years and it never found a regression failure. Do we need to keep automating that? I'm not sure. So how can we go through all of our test suites and determine how to manage them? So this is something I learned about from Ashley Hunsberger. And um, she has this available on GitHub. And this is something she used. She works... She works in a large development organization with web-based applications. And uh, she came up with this test suite canvas. It was inspired by Katrina Cloakey's test suite canvas from Katrina's excellent book, A Practical Guide to Testing and DevOps. And the idea behind this is it's just a framework to help you have kind of a more structured conversation with your team about the different test suites that you have. And, I find it helpful to, when I visualize that pipeline, to make a note of what are the test suites and the test stages of those pipelines and talk about them, talk about each suite one at a time. Or it could be that you have some tests you haven't automated and, and, and you think you have a need for a particular automated test suite, whether it's at the unit level, API level, or UI level. Um, so, I really like the questions on this test suite canvas. It really gets you thinking. First of all, what's the purpose of the test? Well, I was talking with a, a teammate of mine today, and he noted that a lot of times when a test fails, whoever goes to address that failure in the continuous integration, 
doesn't necessarily take time to find out what was that test even trying to test. They just want to make the test pass. They just look at what happened and, and do what they can to make that test pass, especially if it's a flaky test. Uh, but we really should be focusing on what's the purpose of the test. Is it a test we even need? There's no reason to burden ourselves with unnecessary tests. Uh, so what do we want to learn from this particular test suite? What are the benefits? Who needs to know the results? What are they going to do with those results? So these, these are things that are important to talk about this. Uh, I know this is really hard to read, but um, you can you can download it and, and look at it yourself. Um, and, and I'm not going to go through each one of these because I'm checking my time here. I don't have time. Uh, but dependencies, obviously, uh, what tools or are there any external third-party tools or external systems your suites have to in interact with? Uh, constraints. I think a lot of times a constraint can be even an emotional constraint or, or fear. So maybe you have a particular, especially with UI level tests, I found this to be true. The team tried to automate them before and something terrible happened. They were very, they took a lot of time to maintain and they took a lot of time to analyze when they failed. And it's like, we're kind of scared to try that again. So that could be one of your constraints. So thinking about what, if it's going to be part of a pipeline, how you're going to execute it. Are there any gates going into it or out of it? Test data, um, that can be still be an issue. You know, we can generate test data that looks like production. Is it realistic enough? Uh, or could we save time by using test doubles, mocking out? especially if we're testing with, uh, with third parties or external systems. Can we just mock that out? We're just trying to test our code. So think about how we can do that because it can speed the tests up. Now, I think one of the most important things to talk about, especially before you even implement an automated test suite into your CI pipeline is, what is the engagement and failure response? When that test fails, how will we know and who will take responsibility for investigating it and making sure it gets fixed? Um, I, I was on a team where we we had our uh, our pipeline wired up so that if any test suite failed, it would show up on the monitor and the dashboard. There would be something in Slack. And yet people didn't see it because everybody on the team was pair programming. And when you pair program, you don't necessarily notice anything else. Um, so we actually were, had to actually think of an experiment to make sure we noticed failures. And we actually hooked the build up to a flashing police light in the room. I'm not sure what we would do now in remote. I think in the now, now that we're all working remotely, maybe have something pop up in everybody's IDE to say, oh, the build fixed. Are you going to be the one to fix it? Yeah, click OK. Uh, so there are different ways to alert the team. I wouldn't do that ongoing, but that might be something you have to do to, to, to make it a habit. But talk about it up front. How is that going to work? Um, maintainability, obviously, a, a big cost. Cost of maintainability is really important. And you want less time maintaining things than more time for innovation. Um, so and how will, how will we know this test suite is successful? So going through this process talking about each of your test suites is really helpful. You can you can eliminate tests you may not need. You can make tests more efficient or faster uh, and, and just make it a more smooth running process. So get your team together. Use this test suite canvas, download it from GitHub. And uh, and have these conversations with your team about your test suites. Can you automate more of your manual tests? Can you get rid of any tests? And again, I'd really, if you're afraid to get rid of your tests, there's a lot of um, aversion. You know, we're all kind of hoarders at heart. Uh, it's like, uh, we maybe don't want to delete it, but yeah, put it in the garage. Turn the test off. Don't delete it yet. Uh, see if anything happens over time. Did you really miss that test? Uh, so just that's nothing the minimum people minimum sounds like not enough but it's the minimum it's what you really really need and so keep your automated tests to a minimum and what you need to feel confident 
that your new changes didn't break any existing functionality. Um, automated regression tests don't generally find new bugs. They, they can, that's not really what they're designed to do, but we're mainly making sure that our new changes didn't break something that our customers were already using and depending on. So see what you can automate. So we just need a lot of conversation. This is my donkey, Marcella. Um, how do we fit testing activities into the idea of continuous delivery and deployment and keep our pipeline fast? We really, we, we need the ability to deploy to, to production quickly. Uh, how can we do that and be confident about it? I would just recommend it's getting your whole team together. This is something that we need all the different specialties, all the different expertise on the team to work together on, try different experiments and see if we can shorten our feedback loops and improve our ability to get changes quickly and confidently into production. Um, and I'll happy to share my slides. I'm not sure how that's going to work this conference, but I'll, I'll for sure put them on SlideShare or something like that and, uh, and tweet where they are uh, and put in the Slack as well. Um, so these are a few of the resources that I refer to. Um, I don't think I mentioned Accelerate, but I just, I just recommend that book <laughs> every talk I do now because there's so much in it about uh, practices with high performing teams and especially in, re in relating to automated tasks and that that needs to be something that developers own and have testers collaborate with them to create and also having testers on the team to do these manual test stages. So that's actually discussed in the test automation chapter in the Accelerate book as well. So, um, those are those are my resources and now I welcome questions so I'm gonna go see if I can go back here and unshare my screen stop screen all right okay so so we have here one we have a couple of questions here and queued up so one of them is what do you think about website snapshot testing to, to catch individual changes? You know, are there specific tools you, you can recommend? Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of tools out here and this is where machine learning has really uh, shown advantages to help us because I, you know, a few years ago we had some visual diffing tools that we thought were great because it was better than staring at it by yourself and trying to look at two things side by side and, and see if you could spot changes. But that still required a lot of human interaction. This is something that's much better for machines to do. So the machine learning tools or the, the, the machine, you can train them, the, uh, the tool to know what parts of your web page are pretty static and should never change so that you should be alerted if something does change and what parts are dynamic and we know those are going to change all the time don't look at them so um the, off the top of my head um apple tools is is one mabel has a visual checking aspect to it i think maybe test i am does as well um yeah, there are a whole bunch of other testing tools and and probably too numerous to mention and and i would just say give them all a try, see what works in your context. But I think the ones that use machine learning, um, I think those have a, a big advantage. Gotcha. Okay, let me check the other one. So the other one is, uh, could you, there we go here. Could you advise, uh, let's see here. There we go. That keeps showing me the same question. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it seems to be coming. Here we go. Technology. It's a blessing and a curse. I know. Let's see if this one shows up. Uh, could you advise... Uh, I think somebody's here clicking. Let me see. Could you advise uh, some... Actually, that's the one you just answered, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you think about... Well, that, that's the one you just answered. The one, the one that's uh, there. The second one is: Do you advise some uh, tools? Look. Let me see here. Those two were the same. the The other one is: If manual tests uh, run 
manually, what frequency uh, are they running? And does every commit have manual tests run on? Do manual tests uh, run on batch commits? Yeah, that's uh, that's really pretty context dependent. That's what what your team is actually doing. Um, you know, obviously, if you don't have a lot of regression tests automated, uh, you might have to do a lot of manual testing. Um, and and, and um, going back to modern tools and tools using machine learning and, and the heuristics uh, that are available to us now. You know, the holy grail to me is a test tool that will t that will tell us which tests to run based on what was changed in the code. So uh, I think there might even be tools out there doing that now. But in general, I, I can tell you what what my teams have done. So, for example, one team I was on, uh, we needed to do a lot of exploratory testing because we had a, a single page application JavaScript uh, application that was had a lot of concurrent users and was really complex. And we had thousands and thousands of automated tests, but one little change could have unexpected impact. So we had to do a lot of exploratory testing. So a lot of trying scenarios as different user personas, um, trying to trying to do lateral thinking on how, how might our customers use this product, looking at patterns of production usage and trying to replicate those. So what we would do is at the story level, as the developer pair worked on a story, they would automate tests at every level, unit API and UI level. And then when they thought they were all done with the production code and the automated test code, then they would do exploratory testing just on that story. And then as we completed more stories for an, an epic or feature level, then we had exploratory testing charters that were more end to end across the whole feature. And then every, everybody in the team could collaborate to do those. So at that point, by then we had probably deployed the feature to production, but it was turned off with the feature flag. And then everybody joined in and did that exploratory testing. And then when we felt good about that, or sometimes we get together and do kind of a bug bash type test, several people uh, working, doing charters or doing ad hoc testing on the new feature and then, okay, we're, we feel confident, let's turn it on. Of course, we could also turn it back off real quick if anything really terrible happens. So there are a lot of safeguards you can put in and we know that today's systems are so complex, right? And especially distributed systems, we're not gonna be able to test everything. We're not gonna be able to reproduce in a production environment, in our test environment. So we also have to be prepared to have instrumented our code well, have good observability, and be watching what happens in production so we can respond quickly to any problems. But again, to respond quickly, we need a fast pipeline. We need for things to get through the pipeline quickly. So we need that ability. So we really wanna make sure that we minimize any kind of bottlenecks. Gotcha, gotcha. Well. Hmm. That, that's like abstract, correct? I I missed that. Sorry. Oh, that that they don't. There's wait. There's one more question just popped in real quick. Uh, what remote tools can be used uh, to visualize a pipeline in a team? I you know I think you could do it like with Google Jamboard because it has anything that kind of simulates sticky notes. Gotcha. You could even do it with you could do it with a Google Slides. So you could take a Google Slide and pre-populate it with a bunch of uh, text boxes. And then each text box could be, or rectangle could be a, 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 a pipeline stage and then drag those around on your slide. You can do this collaboratively. We did something like this on my team last week. And, and then you can lay out your pipeline in a Google slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are a lot of creative ways we can do this online. And, and I think it's good, I think, when we can get online and draw and type and drag things around together, I think that it's going to help our brains work better. Gotcha, gotcha. So I was saying earlier that that you're are you going to stick around in the DevSecOps track? Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Answer any questions if anybody has any. I'd okay. be happy to do that, and I'll be I'll be I'll be watching. I did I had a couple of work meetings this morning, so I missed some of the conference, and then I did another I did another talk for a, a meetup in Ireland earlier oh, wow. too. So I've had a busy day. So now I'm looking forward to seeing more of these awesome talks. Sounds great. Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks, we'll everybody. See you later. Take care.